<clears throat> Good, thank you so much for the introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is Ashok Kaliswamy. Um, I have a contestant on the autopilot team. Hopefully, you're able to hear my voice and see my screen and video and things. Please let me know if that's not the case. But yeah, today I would like to present uh, our work on what we think is going to be the foundation model for uh, autonomy and robotics. This is not just the work of myself. I'm representing a large team of talented engineers in our team. Let's get started. Um, our team has shipped the full self-driving beta software to uh, everyone who has purchased it in the United States and Canada. Um, there's roughly 400,000 vehicles, and today they have driven uh, up to 250 mile, 50 million miles uh, on FSD beta. Uh, I think the cool thing about this is that this is a scalable self-driving stack that you can take the car anywhere to the US, turn it on, put it in a destination, and the car would attempt to navigate to the destination, you know, handling all of the uh, in, in, like, turns, shopping at traffic lights, interacting with other objects. And all of this is driven primarily by the eight cameras that are on the car that are uh, giving a full 360 degree coverage uh, around the car. The reason that it works uh, well is because our stack is based on, you know, really modern machine learning based stack where uh, a lot of the components of the self-driving stack are just folded into neural, neural networks. And I would say this is different than the more traditional approach to self-driving, which uses a localization maps, a lot of radar, radar, ultrasonics, et cetera, to fuse together. Uh, instead, this is primarily being driven by just cameras. And uh, you can, if you have a test by yourself, you can obviously by the car and experience it. Otherwise, you just have to take my word or look at some videos, but it works uh, quite well. And we are in the process of making it even better. I shared about these occupancy networks that are one of the more important pieces in our stack. Um, I would consider this as one of the foundational model uh, tasks because this is very general. This is a very general task and doesn't have any specific ontology. Um, or like at least robust to ontology errors. Uh, it really just predicts whether some voxel in 3D space is occupied or not, uh, and the probability of that. And, uh, and can ends represent you know, arbitrary scenes. There is no um, labeling or ontology design required. And it's quite general uh, and can apply like anywhere. And in addition to just the occupancy, we also predict the flow of voxels in the future that kind of like gives arbitrary motion as well. Um, and everything runs in real time. This is quite similar to NERF in general, uh, but unlike NERF or like say multi-view reconstruction, which is usually done for a single scene, uh, the, we predict the occupancy based on the eight cameras in real time. So the video stream in, and then we just predict for all of space uh, around the car uh, on whether this voxel is occupied or not, as opposed to like doing this post, like offline post-processing step. So architecture looks, um, you know, uh, with a lot of, it looks very complicated, but then it's actually not that complicated in the end. Um, videos from multiple cameras stream in, and you can choose whatever backbone you want, you know, rig nets, uh, whatever the latest bits, uh, you can throw anything in there. And then everything comes together in a large transformer block that does sort of a spatial attention to build up features and also does temporal attention um, with some like geometry thrown in there to form some features. That, that can then be upsampled uh, into the actual predictions. Uh, it's, it's quite straightforward, even though the diagram looks a bit complicated. And the same architecture and the modeling can be used not just for occupancy, but for other tasks that are needed for driving. Um, obviously, lanes and roads are very important for dri driving tasks, but I'd say lanes are quite obnoxious um, to predict. The reason is, um, you know, first of all, lanes are higher dimensional objects, unlike um, you know, it's definitely not like 1D or 2D, like, you know, high dimensional, and then they have like a graph structure, um, like objects for the most part, like say vehicles, they're self-contained, they're just, you know, local, whereas like, lanes can span the entire road, you can see multiple miles of lanes in your view, um, and they can fork and merge and cause all kinds of trouble in the modeling. <laughs> um, they also have large uncertainty. Sometimes you know you might not be able to like um, view the lanes because they're occluded or it's nighttime, uh, only part of the lane is visible. And it's not just that sometimes even if everything is visible, even humans cannot agree on whether 
something that you're looking at is two lanes or one lane, for instance. So there's a ton of uncertainty in um, like what are lanes. And then it's not sufficient to just predict them as some kind of raster. Uh, it's very hard to use downstream then. So it's better to predict them as some kind of vector representation, you know, like polylines, splines, polynomials, et cetera, to help with use, ease of use. And all of this needs to happen within tens of milliseconds in real time. Like I said, it's like a very difficult problem to predict lanes in real time in the real world. Nonetheless, uh, we use state-of-the-art generative modeling techniques. Um, in this case, uh, we use you know, autoregressive transformers, quite similar to, I would say, GPT, uh, in terms of how we model the lanes. So we can predict the, uh, you know, you can tokenize the lanes and then predict them one token at a time. Um, unlike language, which is mostly linear, we have to, you know, predict the full graph structure. Hence, we come back, uh, predict, you know, what are the forking point, what is the merging point, et cetera. And everything is done end to end uh, using neural networks with like, little to no post-processing required after this. Another important task for still driving is obviously moving objects, you know, vehicles, trucks, pedestrians, what have you. Uh, and it's not sufficient to just detect them. You need to have their full kinematic state um, and also predict their shape information, their futures, et cetera. All of these models, the models that I described earlier, even the lanes one and objects one are in some ways multimodal models in the sense that they take in not just camera um, video streams, they also take in other inputs such as um, in this case, egos own kinematics so egos, um, velocity, acceleration, jerk, et cetera, all goes in. Uh, we also provide in um, the navigation instructions to the lanes to kind of guide us where to, like which lane to use, et cetera. So everything is done in, within the network. That's why I say it's like a modern machine learning stack where instead of doing this in post-processing, we just try to combine everything and then do perception sort of end-to-end, -end, uh, so to speak. So here you can see predictions of these uh, models. Um, the lanes that you see here, the vehicles that you see here are all just predicted, again, these, by these networks with a lot of post-processing. There is no tracking or anything like that uh, in, the, in the things that you're seeing here. So overall, you know, I would say that's quite stable. The green um, spines that are coming out of these vehicles are just their forecasted future. It's kind of like a standard task at this point, I would say, uh, but you know, it all, all works quite nicely and in real time yeah, in the car. Doesn't have to stop with just perception too. Once we have all of these percepts, um, you know, like lanes, occupancy, objects, and even a few more like traffic controls uh, and other things, you can do the entire motion planning um, also using just a network. Um, I won't go into too many details on like how we do that, but essentially, you know, it can just be thought of as like one more task instead of uh, it being a separate thing. So how is all of this possible? And I think it's because we have built this sophisticated auto-labeling pipeline that gives us data from the entire fleet, uh, you know, millions of video clips across the entire world uh, can be tapped. On the left side, what you're seeing is um, an example of multi-trip reconstruction where we choose some location, multiple Tesla vehicles driving through the location, uh, upload the, their video clips and other, other like, you know, vehicle kinematic data to us. We bring everything together uh, and reconstruct the entire 3D scene. Um, so the um, spline, uh, the polylines that you look, you know, the cyan colored one, there's also a few other colored ones. Those are all different cars doing different trips uh, through, through the world. And uh, it's actually all well, very well aligned. Let me see if I can play it again, yeah. The pink line and the cyan line that you see there, those are like different trips of different cars uh, driving around and everything is just aligned very nicely. Um, and this multi-trip reconstruction has enabled us to, you know, get all the lanes, road lines, um, everything directly from the fleet in the millions, um, any, anywhere on earth, essentially. Once you have this like base um, structure of trajectories, calibration, from all these cameras, you can really do a lot of cool things to reconstruct the entire scene. I'm not sure if the video plays quite nicely, uh, but in my own on screen, it looks very smooth where you can see the ground surface. Uh, it's reconstructed quite nicely. Um, there's like no artifacts such as double vision or blurring. Things are like crisp, um, geom look like geometric, they are correct. Um, this is a hybrid approach to NERF and um, general 3D reconstruction. Sometimes in NERF, even though the um, re-rendered visuals might look very nice, the underlying geometry might be very fuzzy and cloudy, 
Um, so we have a hybrid approach, which works quite nicely. You can see here, you know, the barriers, the vehicles, even trucks, et cetera, are reconstructed pretty accurately. Once we have these uh, reconstructions, we then run even more neural networks just offline to produce the labels that we want. Like I had mentioned earlier, for lanes, we need uh, some kind of vector representation to make it very easy to use. Um, so instead of just using a raster directly, take rasters, we have offline neural networks that run on top of it and then produce the vector representation that can be then used as labels for the online stack. Similar to the lanes, like once you have the lanes and the roads reconstructed, you can also auto label traffic lights. Here you're seeing traffic lights auto labeled by your system without any human inputs. Um, and these are all like multi view consistent. Let me try to play it again. Yeah, um, we, we can predict their you know, shape, color, relevancy. Uh, you can see this white traffic lights on the side. They also reproject correctly into all the camera views. And it's because we have this really good uh, auto labeling system that calibrates everything jointly and it's like pixel perfect in 3D space. So, yeah, all of these predictions together you know, give us super solid understanding um, of the world from cameras. And um, I would already try to call this, you know, sort of a foundation model that can be used in a lot of different places. Um, and these predictions really help FSD, um, you know, drive in any place. Uh, like you don't have to geo restrict it. You can, you know, even sometimes construct a new road, turn it on, and it would work quite nicely there. In addition, they also help manual driving, um, obviously, because, you know, uh, humans are not perfect drivers. So they need some help every now and then. In this case, on the left side, the ego driver. Some, for some reason, blew past the stop sign and was almost about to crash into this red car. Uh, and our system, um, you know, detected this and then braked automatically. And similar on the right side, driving straight, and then someone just comes in and cuts us off. It's quite dangerous, but then the system applied the brake quite early. Uh, the reason why this is different than, you know, what you would think that uh, AB systems have been there for since 1980s, what is new about this? I think Tesla is the first company to ship uh, this emergency braking for crossing vehicles, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, and the reason that, that crossing objects are harder, uh, unlike, say, vehicles that are in your own lane, is because um, for crossing objects, you need to know, like, know whether they're going to stop in time or not. Um, what is the stop line? Do they have traffic lights? Uh, and if they were to turn, which lanes would they turn into, et cetera. There's a ton of work that needs to happen to understand uh, where the crossing objects would go and like likely to go. Do they have you know room to stop, et cetera. It's, it's not as simple as just directing a vehicle and having the velocities and things like those. Yeah, so like I said, I think, I, I believe Tesla is the first company to ship uh, crossing AB and it's already in customers' hands in the last several months. But it's a foundation model, really just, you know, a bunch of these tasks concatenated together, or can there be more to it? We think there can be more to it. You know, um, these tasks, like in the occupancy, for example, while it, why it's quite general, um, some, some things are harder to represent even in that space. I'll probably go to more details shortly. So that's why we are working on uh, learning a more general world model that can really just represent uh, arbitrary things. So in this case, what we do is we have a neural network that can be conditioned on the past or other things to predict the future. And uh, I mean, obviously everyone has wanted to work on this forever. And, and I think with the recent um, rise in generative models like you know transformers, diffusion, et cetera, we finally have a shot at it. So what you're seeing here is purely generated video uh, sequences. Uh, given the past videos, the network predicts some sample from the future, hopefully the most likely sample. And you can see that it is being predicted not just for one camera, but it predicts the, all the eight cameras around the car uh, jointly. And see how you know the car colors are consistent across the cameras. The motion of objects is consistent in 3D, even though we have not explicitly asked it to do anything in 3D or not even baked in any 3D priors. This is just the network understanding depth and motion on its own without us uh, in, in informing it of so. And since this is all just predicting future, you know, RGB values, the, the ontology is quite general. You can like throw any video clip from 
you know, driving or you know from YouTube or from, from your own phone, anything can be used to uh, train this general dynamics model of the world. Additionally, it can also be action conditioned. Um, we can show a few examples. So here on the left side, the car is driving in the lane and we're asking it to, okay, just keep in this lane uh, and keep driving. And then, you know, like I said earlier, the car is able to, uh, or the model is able to predict all of the geometry flow by uh, very nicely uh, and understands 3D. On the right here, we're asking it to change lanes to the right side. Uh, maybe we'll go back and play it again. So on the left, it's just going straight. And we ask it to go straight, the model goes straight. And then on the right side, we ask it to make a lane change and it makes a lane change. And the past context is the same for both of these um, outputs. So given the same past, and when we ask it for different futures, the model is able to uh, produce or like imagine different futures. Uh, this is super powerful because you know now you have essentially a neural network simulator uh, that can uh, simulate different futures based on different actions. And unlike a traditional game simulator, this is way more powerful because uh, it can you know represent things that are very hard to describe in an explicit uh, system. Um, I'll show you a few more examples, but then um, it, it is super powerful. And also the motion, the intention, and then the natural behavior of other objects, such as vehicles, is very hard to represent explicitly, but in this world, it's very easy to represent. It doesn't have to stop with just uh, RGB. You can obviously do this kind of future prediction task, not just in RGB, but also in panoptic segmentation, or you can extend it to also 3D spaces, where you can imagine future 3D uh, scenes entirely based on just the past and then your action prompting, or even without prompting, you can predict different futures. Uh, this is, I, personally, I, you know, I'm amazed by how uh, well this works, uh, and you know, it's a very exciting future uh, that we are working on here. Yeah, here are some examples where I think, you know, something like this is going to be needed uh, to represent, um, like, what's happening in the scene. Like, there's a lot of smoke coming in one of the uh, pictures, like, there's paper flying everywhere. You know, that, that's going to be tough for, you know, even... Um, occupancy where, okay, you have paper flying everywhere. There's occupancy, there's occupancy flow, but then how do you know it's paper? What do you know the material properties of it? Um, there's like smoke, obviously you can drive through it, but you know, it is occupying space and light does not transmit through. Um, the, the, you know, there's a lot of nuances to driving and we have to really solve all of these problems to build a general driving stack that can drive anywhere in the world and be human-like, might be fast, efficient uh, at all speeds, yet very safe. Uh, and I think you know we're working on the right recipe for um, building this. And obviously, training all these models takes a ton of compute, and that's why Tesla is aiming to become a world leader uh, in compute. Uh, Dojo is our training hardware that we have custom built at Tesla uh, that is starting production next month, essentially. Uh, and with that, we, you know, we th we think uh, we are on the way to become one of the top. Um, compute platforms in the entire world. And it, we also think that in order to train these foundational models for vision, we need a lot of compute and not just train compute for training this one model, but compute to try a lot of different experiments to see which models actually work well. Uh, and that's why it's super exciting for us to, you know, uh, be in the spot where compute is going to be abundant uh, and it's just going to be monitored by ideas of engineers. And part of this, this is not just being built for the car, but also for the robot. Um, we already have the occupancy network, for example, and a few other networks all shared between the car and the robot. And it actually works quite well and generalizes across these platforms. And we want to extend that to all the, ta all the tasks that we have. Um, even like lanes and vehicles, for example, should not be specific to cars. If the robot, say, happens to walk to the road and looks around, it should understand roads and vehicles and how, you know how vehicles move, et cetera. All of this are just be built for both the platforms and you know any other future robotics platform that would also need this. That's basically it. Uh, yeah. To summarize again, we're building this super cool foundational models for vision that really understands everything. Um, and it should generalize across cars and robots. It's gonna be trained on tons of diverse data from the fleet, on tons of compute. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited for the next, uh, you know, 12 to 18 months of what's going to happen uh, here. Thank you.